Lou is, is head of the Cancer Center at uh, uh, Cornell, as someone who certainly needs no introduction in this uh, setting. Um, he uh, is you know, responsible for a great number of, of just absolutely key and fundamental observations concerning um, uh, cancer drivers and um, cancer metabolism, uh, lipid kinases, SH2, SH3 domains, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so uh, I always um, look forward to hearing a talk uh, by Lou, and uh, today is no exception. So please. Well, thank you, Ira. It's a pleasure to be here uh, to make the long trip. So I'm going to transition from trying to understand how the latest therapy works back to trying to understand how the earliest cancer therapies work. Uh, so methotrexate will really be the punchline of my talk today, one of the oldest drugs uh, for treating cancer. Uh, I will start a bit by introducing this by talking about uh, PI3 kinase uh, pathway and how it controls metabolism, but ultimately transition into folate metabolism. Uh, these are my conflicts. They, I have a lot of them, uh, although none of them are relevant for the talk today. I won't be talking about anything that any of the companies I'm involved with are doing, but uh, the companies include Petro Pharmaceuticals here in New York, Algios Pharmaceuticals in Boston, I'm also on the board of EPI, pharmaceuticals, uh, cell signaling technologies. Uh, and um, I will talk about off-label use of methotrexate. Uh, I'm not sure anybody makes any money from methotrexate, but except for hospitals. Um, and, and the talk will really, the punchline of the talk will really come from work uh, done by a brilliant uh, postdoc in my laboratory, Yu Zhang Zing, who was really responsible for not only the vast majority of the data I'll show you, in fact, almost all the data I'll show you, uh, but also the interpretation of the data uh, and the understanding of the data. Uh, I learned a lot by, from this postdoc, I should say. But this builds on some work that we published earlier when Gina Dick Canola was in the lab and uh, Edward Malarkey and others, uh, where we were trying to understand uh, how NERF2 regulation of metabolism was working. So, this uh, gives an overview of how PI3 kinase has an impact on metabolism. There's a lot, uh, actually a lot more going on than just this, but with regard to glucose metabolism and ultimately diversion of intermediates in glycolysis into nucleotide synthesis, uh, as well as glutathione synthesis, uh, PI3 kinase, we know at the molecular level how a lot of this happens. Uh, we know that uh, AKT does a lot of things to stimulate up upper levels of glycolysis, including stimulating glucose uptake. Actually, I left off the slide the, the latest and perhaps the most interesting observation that AKT also phosphorylates a protein called TXNIP that internalizes glucose transporters and drives degradation of TXNIP. So while AS160 drives glucose transporters out to the plasma membrane, TXNIP internalizes and degrades them, and AKT affects both steps. But probably the biggest effect in cancer is shutting off TXNIP uh, dependent degradation of GLUT1. But AKT can also phosphorylate and activate hexakinase 2, uh, PFK2, which makes fructose 2 6 bisphosphate an activator of PFK1, and therefore really affects all of these steps in getting to the middle of glycolysis. And we showed a few years ago in collaboration with Gerberg Wolf's laboratory that even aldolase is regulated downstream of PI3 kinase, but not via AKT, but rather RAC gets that bind to PIP3 that drive actin. Uh, depolymerization and release of aldolase from the actin cytoskeleton. And so this step is also a PI3 kinase regulated step. And this gets one to the products of aldolase which are necessary for the non-oxidative pentose phosphate pathway. And we're finding in every cancer cell line that we look at that most uh, ribose is being made by the non-oxidative pathway, probably for the purpose of preserving the oxidative pathway for acute needs of NADPH whenever the cell is under raw stress. And we'll probably hear more about that from David Tuvison. Uh, you will talk about ROS, right, David? No, I'm lower than that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Never know. Um, OK, so this, th these inputs then are all downstream of PI3 kinase. And another important step is uh, the ability to make serine. All, not all cells make their own serine, but a subset do. And they do so by amplifying pHGDH which I'll focus a little more on the next talk. In the next slide, PHGDH is the first step of converting 3-phosphoglycerate into serine synthesis. And the last step here in converting serine to glycine 
uh, mediated by SHMT uh, in, uh, allows us to enter the folate cycle and, of course, make glyc glycine, which is necessary for glutathione synthesis. So a lot of these, this pathway is, is involved in, uh, in oxidative uh, redox control. Uh, and not surprisingly, ATF4, which we know is a stress transcription factor, turns up a lot of the steps in the pathway to, to make this happen when cells are under redox stress. But I'm going to focus now on the folate cycle. And this is just a, a little more version of that same slide. So the folate cycle, everybody hates because it's just, it's so complicated. The molecules are so complicated. Uh, and it's, uh, and, it, and it has two copies of every single gene in it. So SHMT1, SHMT2, every step in the pathway is duplicated in the mitochondria. And so why is that so? And the first insight from that really came back in the late 1980s when it was observed that, uh, that the essentially formate generated in the mitochondria is what's needed to drive the pathway uh, in the cytosol. In other words, this pathway is almost always going clockwise. You need the formate generated in the mitochondria from serine uh, breakdown in order to uh, drive the anabolic processes in the, in the cytosol. So this uh, has been duplicated in numerous other laboratories, Karen Balson's lab, Joshua Benefits in the last few years. And we are also able to show that, yes, this, every cell line we've looked at runs exactly this way. And the question is, why is it running this way and what's so important about this? So just to remind you of folate, <clears throat> here's the structure. Uh, this is the tetrahydrofolate, uh, and uh, what <clears throat> we know is that it's, once it gets into the cell, in order to get into the cell, I should say, the folate travels around the bloodstream, typically as a, a polyglutamated form. It gets digested, the glutamates come off. That allows it to get into cells as a monoglutamated species. And then once in the cell, it gets polyglutamated again to trap it in. So unlike many other metabolites that are fluxing in and out of cells at very high rates, lactate and glucose, et cetera. Folate, once it gets in the cell, it pretty much stays there. It takes days for folate to be, to be exchanged in and out of the cell. That means the cell has to conserve that folate and interconvert it and always rebring it back to all the intermediate species without having to import it, at least not at a high rate. So keep in mind, this, this polyglutamate also makes it complicated to identify all the individual species because every species has a variety of number of, poly of glutamates on it. So there could be 10 glutamates, there could be 20, 50, 30. So if you try to do HPLC analysis of this, you just get big smears. So in order to analyze glutamate, you have to, or formates rather, you have to hydrolyze off the polyglutamates. And there's an enzyme that will do that. And so what we did then was label cells with tritiated, uh, tetrahydrofolate tritiated at these four positions here. And then uh, after uh, various hours, we, 48, 74 hours or so, we harvested the cells and then removed the polyglutamate and then HPLC purified the species to analyze them. This is, shows you in a little more detail. We either use, typically use either 48 or 72 hours because it takes a long time to get the folate into the cell. So we're now looking at tritiated folate. And uh, in this work, uh, again, done by Yujing, Zing, uh, Zing uh, shows some surprising results when she did this. She found that there was a tritiated species that migrated to position on the gel, on the, on the HPLC that had never been seen before. So she injected uh, and followed by UV a number of standards of all the intermediates in folate metabolism. You can see some of them, where some of them migrate here. Some of them cluster together at specific peaks. But this peak had never been seen before. And uh, she showed this in lab meeting for an embarrassing number of lab meetings uh, with unknown written above it and the mystery of what is this species. It has to be coming from folate because it has tritium in it. So what she did, in fact, the only time she saw this species was whenever she knocked out enzymes in the mitochondrial folate metabolism pathway. I only show you two of them here, SHMT2 and MTHFD1L, both, both of these 
are mitochondrial enzymes, and they both contribute to formate production. And if you knock down either one of them, this unknown shows up. If you add the enzyme back, that unknown disappears, so it shows this is not an off-target effect of CRISPR. Uh, and if you just add formate to the cells, you can make it go away. So in other words, if you impair the ability of the mitochondrial pathway to generate formate, then this species builds up and you can rescue just by adding formate at high levels to the cells. So what got even more interesting is when she added methotrexate to cells. So if you add methotrexate, you get an even greater amount of the same species. It goes up quite high, migrates exactly the same position as on the previous gel. Here's dihydrofolate. Keep in mind that methotrexate is a dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor. And so when you add methotrexate to cells, dihydrofolate goes up, and it's, but it's not this peak. It's separable from this peak. I suspect that people miss this over the first 50 years or so of doing folate metabolism, because unless you have a very high resolution HPLC, dihydrofolate falls right on top of that species. Everyone assumed it only appeared when you had methotrexate, therefore it must be dihydrofolate. So she took uh, dihydrofolate reductase and NADPH, added it to the purified species. The dihydrofolate shifted back over to here, uh, but this unknown did not change at all. So you can make the dihydrofolate go away by adding dihydrofolate reductase ex vivo to purified in uh, materials. Uh, and this species clearly is not dihydrofolate. So what is it? And, and I have to say it took a while to figure this out. But it was known that, that tetrahydrofolate is quite unstable, and it breaks down to paramino benzoyl glutamate, uh, which I'll show you the structure of in the next slide. Uh, so she guessed that this must be some modified form of paramino uh, benzoyl glutamate because, of the, uh, because it appeared under conditions where that molecule also appears. So for example, you can see that molecule showing up here, paramino benzoyl glutamate, but it's clearly very different from this species, but they tend to appear at the same time. So she guessed that it must be some modified form of that molecule and uh, essentially made a guess that it may be acetylated. She synthesized the acetylated form of this molecule, ran it on HPLC, and it ran exactly the same place as the tritiated molecule. She then treated it with HCl, and it got broken down to paramino benzoyl glutamate according to the standard. So it clearly was an acetylated form of paramino benzoyl glutamate. So how does this all work? Now we know, it's been known for a long time, that tetrahydrofolate is very unstable unless it's either formulated or methylated. So all the other species, intermediates in formate metabolism, are stable except for tetrahydrofolate and dihydrofolate. And they can, over a period of a half hour or so, in an oxygen environment at 37 degrees, get converted to this paramino benzoyl glutamate. And that's by breaking this bond right here. Now the tritium, in our species that we used to label, was both on this part of the molecule and also on this part of the molecule. So half of the tritium was here. So the amount of radioactivity we saw in this was really only half as much of the species was actually being made because we're losing two of the tritiums when that, that's produced. That means there was a lot of this molecule being generated, and somehow it was getting acetylated uh, to the paracetyl species. So the question is, is this really due to oxidative degradation of tetrahydrofolate or dihydrofolate in, in vivo in the cell? So we tried adding peroxide to see whether we could mimic the methotrexate effect or the knocking out of the mitochondrial pathway. And the answer is yes. Just adding peroxide to cells, you get the exact same species appearing with time, uh, similar to, at, to knocking out uh, SHMT2. Uh, and if you do the two together, this becomes the major species. And of course, you've got to double the peak because only half as much tritium in this species as in these species. So this is the major metabolite of folate in cells that have been treated with under conditions of redox stress or methotrexate treatment. 
So what is the enzyme that acetylates it? She made a guess that it may be an, uh, an aryl acetyltransferase, uh, and the one most well characterized is an enzyme called NAT1. So she knocked out NAT1, and that species uh, disappears. So <clears throat> that means this clearly is uh, the enzyme that's uh, doing this acetylation. So the cell has evolved a system for acetylating the breakdown products of, uh, of uh, methotrexate, I mean, sorry, of tetrahydrofolate. And uh, this species turns out to be extremely stable and builds up in the cell. And you can follow cells for days, and this species still is around. So it's, the cells do not get rid of it. They build it up. So it's a history of what's happening to folate breakdown. If you, uh, so the question was, if it stays around so long and it takes a long time uh, for this to happen, uh, why do we see it appearing within like an hour of adding methotrexate to cells? It doesn't make sense if it's such a stable molecule that it should be produced so rapidly. So we looked at the possibility that there was a way of, of reversing uh, the oxidation of tetrahydrofolate because you have to oxidize tetrahydrofolate before it will now break down to this other species. And um, again, making a guess, uh, and based on actually not entirely a guess, an observation, a paper that uh, Yu Zhang read from 1978. I hope everybody here reads all the papers from the 1970s. Uh, actually, some of the papers she showed me were from the 50s. Uh, so she <laughs> definitely knows this field. Uh, she guessed that this might be an enzyme that helps to protect tetrahydrofolate. There was speculation about that in a paper in 1978, long before the tools that we have today to characterize these species. So <clears throat> she, she generated this enzyme, added it to tetrahydrofolate in an oxygen environment, along with NADH, which is required for its activity. And you can see you now get complete stability of tetrahydrofolate. Uh, if you leave out the NADH, it's still degraded. You leave out the enzyme, it's still degraded. So this enzyme, QD, which is uh, in the literature, is defined as a quinoid di uh, dihydroterotene uh, reductase, QDPR, moonlights it in its ability, at least in vitro, to carry out this reaction and stabilize the tetrahydrofolate. So what's going on is, in an oxygen environment, tetrahydrofolate is rapidly converted to this quinoid intermediate, which then spontaneously breaks down into the cleavage products. This step is irreversible, but this step, if the cell contains QDPR, is reversible. So this keeps tetrahydrofolate available for the cell, but once it gets to here, uh, it has to now bring in new tetrahydrofolate, and that takes days. So is that really true? So she knocked out uh, this gene. And you can see now, not only is there a basically high level of the paramino uh, benzoyl uh, glutamate, uh, but it uh, continues to build up so that after uh, 600 minutes, uh, uh, 10 hours or so, it is the major folate species uh, or, or breakdown of folate in the entire cell. And this is quantified over here, the parental the knockdown or overexpression. And if you overexpress this enzyme, you can actually prevent any formation of the species. So it's there to protect the cell. So I'll, this is then my conclusions uh, and, and a little insight as to why, you know, to try to answer Ira's question, is this just a curious observation or can we actually apply it in some way or give us some insight of how we should be using drugs like methotrexate and what other drugs might combine with methotrexate uh, to kill cells? So the first insightful First insight we had is that, that it's true that methotrexate is a dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor, but the reason it's killing cells is not because of inhibiting dihydrofolate reductase, but because in the process of inhibiting it, the dihydrofolate that builds up is rapidly degraded to the species. It's irreversibly, it cannot be converted back to tetrahydrofolate. So the cell is actually getting rid of the, all of its tetrahydrofolate if you wait long enough after adding methotrexate to the cell. So that also tells us we don't have to add methotrexate around the clock. It can be added for you know, maybe five hours or so. Uh, and then the tetrahydrofolates go away. It'll take the cells days to bring them back. And that's an extre extremely vulnerable time for the cell since it can't make nucleotides. It can't make 
uh, methionine, it, uh, all the things that that pathway does are shut off once you've gotten rid of the folate intermediates. Um, so I already told you, this uh, pointer's not working very well, that um, we just confirmed that the pathway is going around the circle, as I said before. <coughs> Uh, we now know that uh, this species is being built up, and it's this, the, the, there are two enzymes in the cell that are actually designed to control the production of the species. So we're beginning to suspect that this species is actually playing some role in cellular metabolism. Why does it stay around so long? Why doesn't the cell get rid of it? Uh, and what is it likely to be doing? Since it's an analog of, tetra of folates, uh, it could very well be an inhibitor or an activator of some step in the pathway, and so we're, we need to dig more deeply into this. The other insight we have is that uh, combining methotrexate with ROS dramatically accelerates production of the species. So this happens very rapidly if you add the two together. And so we already have some evidence that uh, using radiation in combination with methotrexate improves outcomes in a variety of cancers. That's my guess is that's why you see that synergistic effect, but this insight may give us other ways of generating ROS in the cell and combining ROS generating pathways with uh, methotrexate. And then finally, I just want to say that uh, this observation that QDPR moonlights as a protector of the folate species uh, suddenly explains something that's been in the literature for 50 years, and that is the observation that there are a rare number of patients who have both alleles of QDPR uh, mutated, uh, and, and one of the major phenotypes they have is folate insufficiency. So these children have to be treated with high levels of folates continuously, and it's been a mystery as to why losing this enzyme resulted in folate deficiency, and I think this observation clearly makes, explains that. So with that, if there's time, I'm glad to take questions. Yu Zhang really did all of this. <laughs> yes? So, Tom, so I'm wondering for these two enzymes, NAT1 and QDPR, so are, they, are they in the mitochondria? No, cytosol. They're all cytosol. QDPR, yeah. So they, they will surface to one and NAT1 one also. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we think it's the cytosolic species that are preferentially being degraded, although, uh, you know, tetrhydrofolate can move in and out of the mitochondria. There's a transporter. Uh, but that happens probably pretty slowly. So she has some evidence that it's the cytosolic that disappears first, but eventually all of it does. Yes? Have you tried providing the acetylated derivative to the cells to see if the derivative itself has an effect not to be compounding with the effect of the knockout? Yeah, no, that's obviously the next thing to try. Uh, obviously, you have, to, you have to take the glutamates off to get it back into the cell. Uh, but yeah, we can, we can synthesize it without glutamates on it or use enzymes to remove it. Yes, Daphne. We haven't tried that, but uh, as you know, in, uh, ironically, under hypoxic conditions, you get more ROS <laughs> yeah. because of the mitochondrial yeah, the problem. And so, yeah, hypoxic conditions could be much more effective, yeah. Makes sense. So I have a question about um, your statement that you could use uh, methotrexate um, intermittently. So have you actually studied that to see how long treatment you need? No, we haven't. But in theory, you know, the, the question is how much ROS is there? So if there's a lot of ROS, then the tetrahydrofolates might disappear within a, an hour or two of adding methotrexate, in which case you can now withdraw the methotrexate and uh, not have the additional toxicity that is accompanied with that. Uh, so yes, you have to, finding the vulnerability of the cell to preferentially kill the tumor cell versus non-tumor cell, and I think ROS probably is the answer. And how long does it take to reconstitute pools? A uh, couple of days. It takes a little while. Yeah. That was really great. Um, so she's
John Larson had these papers about methotrexate and metastatic melanoma in cells. And um, metastatic cells had more mitochondria than not. So mm -hmm. they're going to basically be making more ROS. Yeah. So you might have a, you know, an angle here that you could play on. Yeah. Yeah. I think just following uh, folate intermediates, following, you know, in vivo in tumors, yeah. is it's feasible to do it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.